Hi, good morning. How are you? Today I'm going to review together with you the assignments, answer any questions on those assignments. There is a written assignment, there is a digital assignment that are due. I am going to finish my demo because there are items from the list on Wednesday's lesson plan that I couldn't go through. And those are vital, as I said, not for the digital assignment, which doesn't have to be that complex, but some of the features I will demonstrate today will be expected if you pick Notion, the Notion app for your final project as the digital tool to realize your final digital project at the end of the semester. If there is time, I will show you a full video or part of a video which is about both Notion and the popular model or concept of second brain. And you find plenty of YouTube video as long as three hours. Some of them we have a shorter one, even if we cannot get through all of it today, I strongly recommend that you watch it, not because you're, you're expecting to replicate those things, but it gives you a sense of the level of complexity that can be reached for a complex knowledge-based project in Notion, and, and that's your goal. You're, you're trying to get there, you're not really managing with the time you have something as complex, but that's your goal, that's your model, or one of your models. I would like today also to talk about the final project and some of the requirements, okay? But it will not be the only time we talk about the final project, and there will be other Fridays when we get a chance to discuss those. Initially, I'll be the one providing some suggestions, tips, and hopefully at some point you will be using those segments to ask specific questions about your projects as you're planning them. In fact, the reason why you find several digital and written assignments overlapping during the first few weeks is that I want to get through the five assignments as quickly as possible during the first part of the semester so that after that point, all you have is keep up with the assigned readings and start working on the project because it is not a paper. It is not the kind of project that you can complete the night it is due. It requires time for design, for execution, for planning. For example, identifying the material, the contents, of your wiki in Notion, gathering that material, and then not only organizing it, but refining the organization, and then preparing for the presentation based on that, which you'll do on Zoom or through a video recording at the end of the semester, okay? So I have been receiving a lot of invitation to pages in Notion where you completed the digital life assignment. Every time I received an invitation, I opened the invitation, the link for the invitation. This is true up until last night. Of course, this morning I was coming to campus, I was in class, so if you sent it five minutes ago and I see the counter went from eight to 13, so more people shared their assignment with me that just wait and what I've been doing is opening the invitation, going to the page where you completed the digital life assignment and I left a comment at the top of the page with your name handle which will prompt a notification in the system where I simply said thank you I will be working reviewing grading this assignment within a few days. So make sure you see that comment. That is the confirmation that I have received your assignment and I've received it 
by the due deadline. Sun just sent a link. In fact, in a few cases, it was just a link that allowed me to see the page, read the assignment, but not include any comments. In that case, I sent back an email saying, can you please grant me editing rights, the rights not only to view, but also to edit or comment. Now there are two ways, as I showed on Wednesday, there are two ways to share a page with commenting and editing rights. One is the crudest, the most rudimentary. That would be to attach those editing and commenting rights to the link. And anyone who receives the link can open the page in the browser and has some of the functionalities. However, it is not the most convenient and the most practical. Now, it is not a requirement. You, you, you are in compliance uh, with the coursework if you do that. But as you can see, if you pick the other option, which would be not to share a link with editing rights, commenting rights attached to it. If you opt for inviting me with my email address, which will prompt an automatic invitation sent by the servers at Notion, then that's where your assignment is. I don't have to store the link somewhere to be able to find it when the time comes to review and grade that assignment. I just open the share section and I see your name there, and I click, and I go, and I review your page, okay? So keep that in mind. The best option, the most convenient for me, is to be invited to your space. And if you already have Notion and use Notion, you just limit my invitation to a page or a group of pages where all of your assignments are, that way you have to invite me just once. And in fact, I see people who have already in their same Notion space, both the assignment, the written assignment called My Digital Life, and the digital assignment called Create a Page, Create Your First Page in Notion. Keep in mind that those are two different assignments. One is written, it's just about the content. It's text that I'm reviewing, it's a narrative. The other is technical, the content is secondary. You just have to show your technical prowess for the other. Let me show you the instructions for the other assignment at the end of this week. And I didn't have any issues from my point of view in overlapping the, the deadlines of those two because if you remember from the get-go from the first week, one of the assignments was continue working on your Notion page, build up based on the demonstration that you followed in class. And therefore, by tonight, you should just be revising, completing, putting the cherry on top and sharing and be done with it. However, I'm cognizant of the fact that some people added as late as Friday and came to class for the first time on Monday or even Wednesday of this week. As I said before, if you need more time to complete the first digital assignment, just let me know. However, be professional, let me know before the deadline, before tonight, and let me know what your plans are. So tell me what date would be convenient and reasonable for you for the completion of the project. Let me know if you need assistance, because especially if you miss the demo, the demo classes on Wednesdays and Fridays, of course, you know you have YouTube videos, right? So make sure you watch the YouTube videos of all the classes. Still, it might be convenient for you to come up on Zoom or come to my office and look at a screen together with me and go through some simple hands-on activities until you become completely familiar with the system. 
I am aware of the fact that in this class there are some people who have been using Notion for a while and, and can do beautiful things, uh, especially from the point of view of design. And there are people that have never had Notion, which is fine. And if you need my assistance, if you need my support, don't be shy, just ask. I haven't received that many questions or that many visits from a class as big as yours, which is a class of 45. So take charge, don't be shy, don't be afraid of asking assistance, even with the simplest thing, how do I create a new page in order to place my assignment there, okay? Or anything else at all. And this second assignment is different, as I said, because these are the expectations, right? That you have one page or a page with one or two sub-pages, and I'm expecting to find lists, bulleted and numbered, links to other pages and the outside world. If you don't have other pages, just the outside world, the internet, have a few images there, of course, try to be legal, remain legal. If you need to import a legal images, image or a few of them without copyright issues, where is that you go? Where is a place where you find hundreds of thousands of pictures, nice pictures with no copyright issues? Don't tell me Google, right? Where do you go? What's the largest repository of copyright free images. I see a bunch of pirates, right? You just go and get whatever picture you like. It doesn't matter who shot it, who has the right, who, who said. Somebody answered though. No? I thought somebody had tried to. Wikipedia? Wikipedia. Go to Wikipedia. So at most, Wikipedia will require you to acknowledge the source especially when it's not Wikipedia, when Wikipedia itself is allowed to use that under a creative uh, recognition, uh, creative attribution uh, clause, whereby you are free to use an image that I make public as long as you mention who made that picture, who owns the right to that picture, okay? So don't go out stealing pictures from wherever you want, be legal, use Wikipedia, because you find all kinds, of, it doesn't matter what you, you are talking about, you'll find pictures there. Embed a meaningful YouTube video, have headings, subheadings, have a table of content, and you can go beyond that, but keep in mind that that's sufficient, and, and going beyond is required for the final project. Okay, now even during today's presentation, today's demo, feel free to ask questions, okay? And keep in mind that next week, we move on to another app, which is Evernote. And we'll spend three weeks on that. We'll do a digital assignment on it. That might be a second best option for your digital project, however, for those, anyone who's, who is planning to work on their final project in Notion, the fact that we're moving on to Evernote doesn't mean that you cannot, from any point on, from this point on, that you cannot come to me and request my assistance, especially privately in my office or on Zoom, okay? I'm, I'm here for that. So, That's the demo from Wednesday. We saw how to embed a PDF, a Google Map, a Google Drive. I forgot to include, and I added this later, an important feature of Notion. A very interesting feature, something that you can codify in HTML, but of course, it does require a little bit of an effort in here it is much easier. And that's the, case. that's the thing that every block, and a block 
is anything where you see the six dots, right? So every line in here is a block. However, a block can also be anything I select. So if I select some of this link, then this entire thing becomes a block. Anything with the dot next to it can be associated with a link. Let me see, something, something happened here. Let's do it again from, from here. There it is. Copy link to block. If you click on this option, then the clipboard of your tablet, Mac, PC device will be filled with the link to that specific block. And keep in mind, it is something that you have to handle through the clipboard because you see how complex the links are because you have a bunch of server run by the Notion company and those are the codes associated with space on that server. They don't worry about providing nice, nicer links or links you can memorize. So you copy the link there, you can have the link to a specific block, to a specific section, to a bunch of blocks selected together so that you send the user not just to one page where some content will be found and yet the user will have to your the, the visitor to your page your team collaborator would have to scroll up and down until they identify the exact section they need you send them straight to the block or blocks of text where they will find what they're looking for the only annoying thing the only negative is that instead of placing the cursor at the beginning of a block you've linked, when you click on the link you've created, you'll be taken to the selection of the block. So this is what your user will actually see. If I copy the link to this block and I place it somewhere else, let's call it internal link to a single block of text and I can select this and now did I copy it let, let me try again because I'm not sure I clicked and copied it so I copy the link okay I copy it then I select where I want to paste it I press Control V it would be command V and you see that has become a clickable link now when I click on it as I said before, I would have preferred, it would have been more elegant if the cursor moved here without occupying the screen with this selection, without distracting the user I'm providing the service to, right? And instead, this is what happens. You have this yellow, this, this clear, pale blue um, highlight on the screen for the block that you have linked. But it's still something useful and easy to implement. We've seen how to share a page. Now the next thing is the first fundamental requirement for the final project. The final project cannot be a bunch of pages because after all, the purpose of the digital project is to show me that through the use of a digital tool such as Notion or Evernote or DocuWiki, you can achieve more for a knowledge-based project than a group of pages posted on the web and done with HTML or any other similar website editor. That is to say that you've built in a system of relationships, of connections, you've designed the project in such a way that the content can be dynamically reorganized and offered through 
select filtering in such a way to the user that they can search in a large database. Of course, your project will not have to be large, but you'll have to have at least 20 or 30 different pages because otherwise the demonstration, the, the, the prototype will not really work. And that's why my recommendation number one is find content that you're familiar with because otherwise how can you match the content with some intellectual design. Also find content that you have access to because you cannot waste any time producing the content for the project. The project is about the design, it's about the structure, it's about the relations, the links, the tags, the properties, etc. So best choice, notes from this class, notes from any other class that you have available in a digital format. If there is anything else that you're knowledgeable in and you may have access to third-party content legally and organize it, that would be a second choice, but not the best choice after all, because it is still somebody else's material. If there is some knowledge that you possess that you haven't uh, uh, turned into digital data, but you can do it quickly because you have already the elements then go through that process. But again, you have to start planning by, not next week, but within two or three weeks after you've seen the second digital tool, you should have an idea of what you use for the digital project and start planning the first phase, which is what kind of content am I going to use? Now, anyone using Notion already might think, oh, I've got a nice thing coming because I have my notes, so my notes are my project. Well, not necessarily, because again, I'm not giving you a grade for notes you've taken in Organic Chemistry or Political Science 313. It has to be more than a bunch of notes that I could place in any text editor or word processor. It has to be notes that are organized, linked, tagged, uh, that have properties that allow me to go through those notes and search those notes and find what I'm looking for with a quick, very, with very few steps, okay? So let's see how you create a table. We've discussed that there are three ways to create a page in Notion. One is to simply use the plus icon that you find in the sidebar. Okay, so we'll try to continue, interrupt me if it is too much and you decide that we should go outside and enjoy the weather. Okay, so I was saying there are several ways to create a page in Notion. The first, the simplest is just to use the plus sign that you find at the bottom of the sidebar next to each page you've created, which can become a group of pages. If you click the plus there, then you add a sub page Finally, the most practical, because as I said many times, programmers, professionals who work in this field want to type as much as possible, not rely on the mouse, etc. You simply start with the at sign and you type the title of your new page. Once the dialog box recognizes that you're not trying to link to an existing page, the commands will change. You'll have in that pop-up window, create a new page. You finish typing the title of the page, you confirm create a new page, and you have a sub page. You have a link to an empty page, which is typical of wikis. It happens with MediaWiki, the language of Wikipedia. It happens with DocuWiki. And you click on that link to an empty page and you populate that page with content. However, you go to a new page, there is always a step that allows you to choose between two basic modalities. The third would be selecting a template, but very few people use templates outside of big organizations where someone will be uh, uh, in charge of 
establishing the standards for templates and issuing those templates, making them available across the system. Otherwise, the other two modalities that you opt when you go to an empty page is just type text and the page will become a white canvas where you can add anything. The other option that you may have ignored, even if you were using Notion right now up to this point, is create a table. Now, table is very ambiguous. And I don't know why Notion went that way in terms of language and nowadays, even though they had to retain the use of the term table for back compatibility and also not to uh, confuse the existing users, now they're also using the term database because essentially a table is a database. A database that allows you to add more pages and organize those pages. So this is an example. Let me find it. I'll show you first. I have it somewhere here. There it is. So as I said before, I gave this page a title, I created a new page, I clicked on it and I selected make it a table. And this is what a table will look at, like. Actually, you can also embed a table in any other page. Again, this is not the same as the table of contents. This is not the same which you can, of course, introduce. It's not the same as a table with rows and, rows and columns, headings, etc., which you can also create, even include some formulae, Excel-like formulae, simplistic compared to Excel, but still better than nothing. This is how a table appears in uh, Notion. This is just the beginning, because as with a regular table, hence the name no matter how confusing it may be initially, you may have as many lines as possible. You can always add a line. You find the plus, you add the line. And you can have as many columns as possible. The first column usually, but it could be the second or the third. But you will always have a column where name, and you can change this if you want, will be the column where new pages are created. Because within this column, after I create a table, you see I find new. I can just go here and I can type page 43. And I can open it. And of course, you, you've seen before that you have two options for quick operations. The page will pop up and float on the screen so that you can quickly type something and then you just have to escape or press outside this area and you'll go back, the page will disappear, you'll go back to your work. Again, expediency, speed is what they have in mind. However, if, you're, if you know you're working on this page for long, then you see that I've made it full screen and I can work on that. Within this page, I find a series of options which I can modify, which are part of my own template for this particular database. And this time, you see, you have the enter to continue creating an empty page or create a template. I can add a comment, etc., etc. As I said before, though, if I type slash and then table, you see I start typing TAB and immediately I'm offered with two options. One is the simplest, add a simple table to this page. This would be a table where I put the name of a student, next column, Great for the first assignment, my digital life. Next column, great for the second assignment. Create a page in Notion, etc. At the end, average, right? That would be the tables you're familiar with. Next to it, you find 
what Notion used to be calling tables, and now they call it table database in line. And there it is. Even inside the table, I can have multiple levels. So this is yet another way to cluster the pages because you want to break down a big project into manageable clusters. Especially since one of the limitations in speed, in terms of speed of Notion, something that I find annoying, is that a single table works well enough, smoothly enough, quickly enough, fast enough, until you have 500, 800, maybe 1,000 uh, pages in that table. Longer than that, it'll be very annoying. The pages will be visible, but as you scroll down, the page will take its time to load more pages to show to you. So really, the most manageable table would be ideally a table with 200 or 300 pages. Again, not that you have to do something like that as big for your final project. It's just to say that it's more convenient to create a series of tables, and if they're connected, then you can have this layer where some of the pages created from here include a table and therefore they have pages at the level underneath, okay? And the same thing. I'll give it a title and then I can just say sub-page one. I, I don't have any imagination, so you fill up with something meaningful. And then I can open this page, etc., etc. Okay, let's go back to the table we had. Notice that we have the breadcrumbs on top. In the language of wikis, these are called breadcrumbs, not just in the language of wikis, but they were part from the beginning of the wiki systems, whereby I can click at the top instead of opting for the backspace button, because I can go at different levels, and you'll see that inside more advanced more professional wiki software, uh, uh, such as DocuWiki, you can organize the breadcrumbs, not just hierarchically, but chronologically, and you can have as many as five or 10 different links, and, and whenever you get lost in the system, because a wiki can be like a labyrinth, you go back, you look up on the page, at the top of the page, you see the links, and you spot where you want to go back in which net of this knowledge would, would you, you want to uh, uh, make your way. So I'll click on table and I'm back here trying to observe this. Notice that I have set up the system in such a way that there is a catch-all tag, right? CCS 395. The moment I created this, it was tagged as CCS 395. Look it up in the help or in the tutorials, or schedule a meeting with me to go through these particulars, through these details. For now, I want to introduce the big things so that you have the big pictures, and then you, you're smart enough, you can work out some of the details yourself. So you can add in here as many tags as possible. And what's the purpose of the tags? To filter the pages. Because once I have 300, 500 pages in here, and I'm looking for something, instead of relying on the find, and I promise to show the find, and it's either you go to the sidebar or you press Control P, and there you have it. And it starts simple, right? And once you add words, then you see that immediately it starts collecting um, pages containing the word speed. I teach a class on automobile and society. I don't do just software, I do hardware as well. Um, but more importantly, you have the option of another filter in here, which makes it more interesting. Of course, you see sorted by best matches, but you can sort it differently, last edited, created, etc. Let's look at add filter and you can match only titles or 
you can select properties or you can add more things. For example, you can select a bunch of pages to this. Just move on for now. So tagging is not random. Tagging has to be part of the design. Of course, it doesn't mean that you don't evolve the system of tagging alongside the project itself. Keep in mind that a wiki is a project where you develop the structure, that you start with a minimalistic structure, and then you make it more complex the more knowledge you acquire based on the expertise, based on your needs. You revise the same way that it should be done in, on, in any kind of intellectual or scientific process where you collect data, which means you have to define data, create a matrix to know what is data, what is not data. Then you analyze data, and the analysis brings you back to the collection, makes you rethink what you need to collect, and then you analyze, you, you structure data for access and dissemination, and finally the last part is you apply the knowledge you've created with this system to produce something new. So, same with tags. You may start at the beginning of a project with just a few, and you add more tags as you see fit, right? Because you go through the pages so many times during your work that at some point you say, well, I need to tag this kind of semantic content in the page as well. Same with the pages. You go through the pages and at some point say, this page has grown so much that I need to split it because I don't want to have a page that is 10 screens, 20 screens. I, I, I split it and then if I really need to have everything together, I use sync and I'll show you sync if I have time uh, before the end of this class. Otherwise, I'll, I'll prolong this demo into next week. So general rules, you need to have a catch-all tag. And then you go from general to particular. You don't want to have tags that catch too many pages because that would be time consuming. At the other end of the spectrum, you don't want to have tags that are so specific that they identify only one page. Okay, And of course, you find uh, various philosophies, various systems and ideas over the internet and especially on YouTube. One of the most common is the PARA system, P-A-R-A, -A, uh, whereby you organize things by project, area, resources, and application, right? But depending on the kind of project you have in mind, you can come up with a different kind of system. So I would expect to find for every page a minimum of three tags because I want to have a very generic catch-all tag. I want to have the next level of generality under that, the general area. Then I want to find one or two tags that are more specific. If you find a page that has 30 tags, it's time to split that page, right? Because it means that you open that page, either that page is a quick text where everything is summarized, fine, or that page is so long that even when you catch it through filtering, then you have to scroll and scroll and scroll, go through with your eyes until you find what you're looking for, which is not efficient, which is not supportive of the kind of focus you want to have at any time exactly on the info that you need. You don't want to feel overwhelmed by the information. And that's why you have the idea of a second brain. That is to say that you store your knowledge inside a system that replicates what your brain does. Your brain has a neural network, has synapses, connected things, and the more you frequent somebody or something, the more synapses, the more connections are created, right? Same with your readings and knowledges. Right? I hope you're not coming just to sign the attendance, right? And, and keep in mind, we have the videos. Okay. Uh, you 
develop a level of familiarity with the material that allows you to multiply the connections to a point where the system is more than the sum of its parts. The system offers more than just storing notes in a text editor and then retrieving what you need every time using the find, even when you have, let's say, regular expression and advanced search that allows you to do complex advanced searches. This is more because all of those connections at some point will solidify a new concept, a new idea. The same way that your brain is trained to read material, learn about that material, build more and more connections, and at some point, all of a sudden, with a quantum leap, that knowledge uh, materializes into, uh, turns into the next level of knowledge, and from being a student who has memorized the material, you go to the level of becoming an expert to gain expertise whereby you can manipulate mentally that material. You're able to recall something connected to something else where the connection is not immediate, right? The same way a doctor or a medical doctor or another professional would do, right? Remember what I said, why cannot they diagnose yourself on Google? And keep in mind, I'll go back to that presentation on Google that I skipped on Monday this coming Monday, because starting from the level of data, you have to recognize what is data, what is not, what is relevant, what is not. And the problem with putting in the search box your symptoms is before you start typing. That's where the problem is. What is a symptom? If I'm coughing, is that a symptom? Is that a meaningful symptom in the context of my body at that time. And that's where you need the doctor, because the doctor will say, how many times have you had that? You say, doctor, I, I have a cough. And the, and the doctor disregards that completely, because they know that it is something else. Maybe you, your throat is dry, or maybe you have a nasal drip, because you have a stuffy note that causes that cough, but that cough is not a, a, a meaningful symptom to class it together with other things you may have, and then the doctor will find symptoms that you didn't know of, right? Because the doctor will run a test, take your finger, touch your nose, or uh, lift your arms, or both of your arms, or do this, do that, and inspire, expire, and uh, the, they'll be able to add to the list of symptoms where what you identify as relevant data for that search is not data at all. So you need to have as many tags as needed in order to manipulate this connection, collection of data in a way that is efficient, that supports your focus, your restricted focus. You need to focus only on some uh, of the pages at any time and in a way that adds value to the collection because it little by little builds up stronger connections, which is something your brain does automatically just by reinforcement. And a system like this is programmed to do indirectly, but that's why it's your second brain where you can expand your expertise before it becomes expertise. Because you have already, you're on track to some kind of professional expertise through your minors and uh, majors. And that is already being structured for you. Although, please, don't just take the classes. Don't just do the readings. If you're in a major and you do, don't do anything by yourself, you don't do an extra reading, you don't talk to a professional in that field, you don't have interest or curiosity beyond the class, then you don't really belong there. You do because, of course, you're smart enough to get accepted at Stony Brook. You can do whatever you want, right? But you have to find something that matches your drive, your interest, and your talents so that it's not a chore, it's not a burden if at some point you say, even if it is Friday or Sunday, or I have some free time, my interest is so strong that I want to read this book, which nobody assigned to me, simply because I find pleasure in, in, in expanding my, my expertise, okay? So this is the idea, that you build something that creates intuition, and that's what we defined 
on Monday as an epistemic engine, an engine that facilitates the production of knowledge, that supports a practical, quick access, retrieval, analysis, and uh, creation of new knowledge. Okay, so your project, if you pick Notion, will have to be this format. We'll have to start with a table. Then you can go from a table at level one to tables that are stored in subpages if you want. You can make it as complicated as you want to. The other thing besides having a row where you create new pages is that you can have as many columns as possible with different properties. And these properties can be free text, text that you just add, or they can be codified as a selection of options. Uh, I could have options such as which day of the week I have a class, and then the options to choose every single time. I wouldn't have to type the name of the day, would be pick one among Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, etc., cetera, and, and, and so on. But to have the name, the pages, and tags, and one property is really the minimum. Ideally, you want to have more properties because these properties are relations, are connections, are ways to filter and sort in many different ways this. What, something that you cannot do with a bunch of web pages because it's there, the content is there, but every time you have to go through the pages, you have to click and read the pages, scroll the page and find the information, or you're limited to finding a key term or an expression, a phrase. Whereas in here, you may have hundreds of pages or hundreds of pages at each level in multiple tables and so many properties that there is an endless way to reorganize these pages. And at any time when you reorganize them, you hoist, you lift some of them to your attention and you create the basis for learning, which is, and productivity, which is availability, right? The threshold has to be low. Have you heard of uh, simple tricks to uh, avoid being addicted, binging TV series? You put the TV away. You put the TV inside furniture. You, you have even just doors, panels that close on the TV. You put the remote in a drawer because that means that you have to go through these steps before you watch TV. You don't just jump on the sofa and click and you're done and you're a zombie for the next 12 hours and you go through an entire season of whatever, right? Same here. If you lower the threshold to accessing information, it means that your knowledge will be more accessible, you'll be more productive in terms of building an expertise. If you lower the threshold to creating content in the pages because you just type and it goes online and then you retrieve it from your phone, from your tablet, here or uh, uh, 10,000 miles from here, that too is a big advantage, that too uh, takes you a step farther um, 